Welcome to the first of four open match shows that we're bringing you to from Abu Dhabi this week. I'm Adam Catterall, alongside me as always Nick Pete. This man doesn't need any introduction whatsoever, the one and only Mr Dan Hardy. As you can see in the background, we've just completed the uh, open workouts here in this fantastic mall here in downtown Yaz Island. Dan, you've been looking at the into the eyes of some of these fighters. What do you make of it? Any standout points? Anything that you're looking at and you think to yourself, oh, maybe, maybe this guy might be struggling with a bit of weight? Because let's be honest, that's what the fans are looking for. Yeah, you know, to be honest, and you, well, you pointed this out, we'll touch on it in a second, but the, the condition that Paul Felder and Edson Barbosa are in. Yeah. I mean, we expect it from both guys, but they're just, they're shredded. And, and this is a rematch, which makes it even more interesting because the first one was so close. Paul Felder was a young fighter at the time, at least in his UFC career. I feel like he's developed a lot since then. And, you know, Edson Barbosa has moved his camp to American top team. That's going to add new things to his game. So I'm interested to see how they two, they come back together when they rematch. Nick, talk to me about that development of Paul Felder, because like Dan said, since that first meeting, he's come a long way in this game, hasn't he? Well, he has come a long way, and the only fight he's lost recently was up at welterweight, you know, in the first time he fought Barbosa. Edson Barbosa was very much a title contender in the lightweight yeah. division. Right now, Edson Barbosa's struggling to win, string two wins together. So we find these two guys in completely different parts of their careers, if you like, and it could be a little bit of a crossroads. Now, I'm with Dan. On stage today, Edson Barbosa, Paul Felder both look like they, they, like they were on weight, absolutely ripped to bits, you know, body fat. 5%, maybe between 7%, them. you know, yeah, between, yeah, between them. them. Crazy, but the that might be thing... including the referee as well, depending on who's in the <laughs> yeah. the, the one thing I was talking to Dan about while it was happening, I said, what worried me is Paul Felder put a shift in. You know, a lot of people like Khabib come out and just done a QA. and a Paul Felder come out today and done 20 minutes of work. And after 20 minutes of work, he stopped, he was talking, he was chatting with Dan. There wasn't a bead of sweat on his entire body. Now, for a guy that's at least 10 pounds overweight, that's got to be concerning, Dan, knowing you've got to cut potentially 10, 15 pounds in the next 48 hours. Yeah, you know, potentially. But then the, the one thing, because I've been thinking about it since you mentioned it, and it, 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 is, it is something that we have to bear in mind, because obviously, especially with him being so lean, you know, someone that is very lean, when they start to sweat, they will just release that water because it's all, it's muscle tissue that's dehydrating, as opposed to body fat, which kind of hangs on to water. Um, but, it, I mean, he is incredibly well conditioned. There, I don't know where, he, where he's going to lose it from. My question really is, what is he doing with his hydration right now? Mm. Yeah. I mean, is he water loading right yeah, now? Because if I was at this stage, I would be water loading, which means my body would be ready to sweat. But maybe Paul's got a different method. You know, the flight is something to take into account. You know, your body does retain water when you travel a distance, and obviously he has done. So, yeah, really we need to know what he's doing with his water. You know, if he's rehydrated today, if he's hydrated today, he should have been sweating more than that, I would have mm. thought. Yeah. yeah. Talk to me about atmosphere, right? You've just come back from oh. Shenzhen last weekend. Yeah. Sensational in itself. The turnout. And obviously the noise for Habib was just ridiculous when he when he stepped out on that stage. It, it was amazing, exactly what we expected. I was more surprised actually at the, the reception that Poirier got. You know, they, they, they were very respectful, a lot of cheering, a lot of clapping. And, uh, you know, communities around the world that are into mixed martial arts, they understand that a good fight takes two people. Yeah. They don't want to see someone just walk through another, another fighter. That's not what they're here for. They're here to see how good Khabib is. You know, 27 and 0, like, we need to see him tested. We need to see a good Dustin Poirier that's in shape, in condition, confident that he's going to win. And that's exactly what we got. So then I think, when, you know, when Khabib came out, knowing that he's got a good opponent in front of him Saturday night, I think the fans are even more supportive. Uh, it was incredible. And, and as you were saying, you know, Zhang Wei Li in China, you know, each one of these, these areas of the world are embracing their own stars and they're just, they're, they're celebrating them. That's what we've seen with Khabib and with Makhachev when he came out. Yeah. Now, we've all had recent conversations with both of the lads involved in the main event, okay? You got the good end of the deal because you got to speak to him once they'd had breakfast yeah. in London. In when London, they, couple of weeks You know ago. what I mean? We always get the wake-up weeks. <laughs> What's all that about? I we get it when they're not, not here. Yeah. When they're growling at us <laughs> exactly. and not wanting to say anything. You've obviously just spoken to them both on the stage. I spoke to them both yesterday. I think the one thing that we're all in agreement with is the attitude of Dustin Poirier because a lot of people are beaten way before they step into the octagon with, with Habib. This guy, there's something in his eyes, he seems relaxed, he seems very loose, and he's talking a very, very good fight. How important is that? Yeah. Because half of the battle with this guy against Habib, should I say, is mental, isn't it? Yeah, of course it is, but listen, this is a guy that's got nothing to lose. He's come all the way to Abu Dhabi, you know, where, where there's a strong Habib presence here. You know, the fans proved that today. No one, let's be honest, no one's expecting him to win. If he wins, it will be a shock. You know, he comes from an incredible camp. They'll have done the due diligence completely on Khabib's style. They will have a game plan at A, B and a C to try and break Khabib down. But with Dustin Poirier, I think he'll get in on Saturday night. He'll be free flowing. And what I like about Dustin today, Dan, is on stage, 
we don't usually see this open workout. I always try, you know, don't look too much into the open workout, but today I had to because of everything he was doing. It was three punch combination sprawl, three punch combination sprawl. I think we're going to see a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And then later on in his, in his workout, it was all about the uppercuts coming under, step back, uppercut, step back, uppercut. All right, I settle down. You're going to take be... someone down. <laughs> <Yeah, exactly. I'm laughs> <excited laughs> but I think you get you get a sense of what he's planning to do now. Incidentally. Habib's dad came out mm. and watched the entire, yes. Dustin's entire workout, you know, and maybe that was why Khabib fancied the Q&A. Why give, why give the opposition any kind of advantage? I'm going to do nothing. You're not going to know anything about what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, I mean, Poirier kind of played that game as well. He wanted to show the fans something, but he didn't He didn't give anything away. I mean, yeah. there were a couple of things that stood out. The, right, the, the left hook to the body that he was setting up, that, in my mind, makes me think that he's going to start trying to work on areas to open up other areas, open up the head because the, the arms will drop. And he started to use that like rising jab as well, yeah, like yeah. he was using in his last fight against mm. Iaquinta. Not the last fight, the Iaquinta fight. He was bringing the jab up, which it fills that central channel where Khabib's going to be level changing because Khabib move, moves forward so quickly. The uppercuts and that lazy rising jab, I think, are going to be quite useful at keeping that distance between mm. them. Yeah, it's like regarding what you were just saying there regarding punch combinations then going into a sprawl expecting the takedown immediately we don't normally see that if, you, if people are watching this and they're boxing fans normally when you're throwing a combination you, you're on the offensive yeah. you're not automatically then thinking straight into defence whereas it seemed Dustin had that in the back of his mind preparing for Habib yeah well, he's, he's such an aggressive fighter you yeah. know he's a front foot fighter he likes to switch his stance and square up so he is vulnerable to the takedown a lot of the time in his fights and he's aware of this he knows this knowing what Habib's going to do he needs to be prepared mm. for that so one thing he doesn't want to do is stifle his offensive. He doesn't want to feel like he can't throw because he's expecting that shot from Khabib. But, you know, we talk about striking sports, we talk about boxing. What you've got to think about in boxing is if you're throwing, your opponent's either covering or countering. In MMA, if they're level changing, those punches are going into thin yeah. air. And then yeah, you've got yeah. to think about your lower body. And if Khabib gets a hold of you, you might not get back up again. Yeah. Do True. you personally, as a fighter yourself, I'm saying that because we know what's going to happen, my as a, friend. As a, as a, as a fighter yourself. As a fighter yourself. <laughs> um, do you read too much into Habib not doing an open workout with maybe past conversations from fans that maybe he does struggle with the cut down to 155? Everything's got to be absolutely bang on and methodical. If he does too much today, does that take too much energy out of him? I don't know. As a fighter, what's your opinion he on it? He mentioned it, didn't he? He mentioned yeah. it three times. You know, I'm gonna go and make weight now, I'm gonna go and make weight. Like he was asking the fans to support him. It's like, he's got to fight before the fight. Edson Barbosa and I think Felderman are in the same boat. But I don't think Dustin Poirier is in that boat. I think Dustin Poirier can kind of focus on mm. Saturday night a lot more than yeah. the next 48 hours. I think Khabib's first fight comes now. Yeah, I agree. I mean, they're both gonna have a battle with the scales because they do, but obviously Poirier coming up from featherweight, it's gonna be less of a challenge for him. The other thing, going back to what, we, what you were mentioning about Paul Felder, Poirier had a good sweat on. Yeah, yeah. The one thing you have to consider is if these guys are cutting weight, you don't want to start your body sweating, then cool down, then try and get that sweat started again. Mm. So Poirier looks in a comfortable place where that sweat's going to come off no matter what. He can do two, three training sessions and be comfortable. Whereas Khabib, I think he's he's waiting for that opportunity for when his body to start sweat, he's going to keep it sweating and lose as much as he can. Mm. Good point. Right, now, they're the two main events, and don't forget, we have got more preview shows coming your way this week, of course. We've got the uh, media day tomorrow, we've got the weigh-ins as well, and then we'll have a post-fight show where, hopefully, we're talking about fireworks. That's what we want to talk about. But first of all, just for the benefit of people watching this at home, they know about the two main events. Give me one other fighter that he's fighting on this 15-fight card. Yeah, we're just going to tease him with one. You could do another one tomorrow, mate. Yeah, but give thanks. me one that okay. they need to look out right, for. Okay. If I get one a day, then, I, then the one <laughs> I'm going to pick today is uh, Joe Calderwood. She was on stage earlier. She looked amazing. She's been in Vegas for a while now working with John Wood. John Wood's been embedded in MMA in Vegas for a long time. So many fighters come through his gym, including myself. I did a lot of prep at Syndicate as well. And I just feel like because they've got such a good close working relationship, some of the, the ideas and principles that John Wood will try and impart to Joanne Calderwood will now start to stick. Yeah. She'll start to try and use them in sparring comfortably, which I think we're going to now start seeing in the fight. And she's fighting Andrea Lee, who's not only is she a very tough, durable fighter, but she's got a skill set in every range. Now, you look at Joanne Calderwood, she's a tie boxer. She's Absolutely. a great tie boxer. But sometimes we've seen her taking her out of her element and look quite uncomfortable on the ground. So they need to negate that 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 conflict within her so she does throw those elbows and knees and she is venomous when she's thrown because when when somebody engages her in striking range she's dangerous oh, yeah. yeah no I, I go back to the Valerie Latorno fight where she was front kicking her in the face and then chasing her down you know yeah, yeah. that's the Joanne Coldwood we need to see but if she's concerned about a takedown we're not going to see that aggression from her so we need to see 
you know, the knees coming up the center, the front kicks, you know, good management with the jab. And I would say her stance was slightly lower as mm. well. So the thing is, you know, when you're fighting a, a, an opponent that's got a, a, something in every range, you kind of can't stack all your chips on one color. Yeah. You've got to spread them out. You've got to kind of play the odds a little bit. So how does she expect Andrea Lee to show up? Mm. We don't really know. She's hoping for a kickboxing match, but she has to be prepared for an MMA fight in case she, you know, she starts working takedowns. Is, yeah. the, is the pressure uh, on Jojo this weekend? Do you think that given her last performance where she didn't really can they pull the trigger? Yeah. Uh, I think she's got to pull the trigger here because as Dad says, she can't go in there waiting for an opponent to do something, letting an opponent dictate what happens in the fight. Jojo just got to play to her strength, got to keep the fight standing, she's got to use her range, and she's got to be aggressive on the feet. Because if she does that, she can kind of beat anybody in this weight division. But we just don't see it enough. And on stage, she's so sweet and so lovely. We don't want that. Jojo, on Saturday night, I want to see Jojo the killer. That she can do something. Uh, now, as I said, this is the first of four open mat shows from Abu Dhabi this week that we're going to be bringing you. Tomorrow, of course, we will be at the uh, media day where hopefully we'll be having various guests and sticking microphones in their faces and getting their thoughts on how the uh, big fight will be going down at the weekend, which, by the way, is available on BT Sport box office from 7 p.m. Make sure you get involved with this because you're not going to want to miss this card. Yay! Thank you very much for watching. To get more of our exclusive UFC 242 content from Abu Dhabi, click here. And to order the event on BT Sport Box Office, click here.